are unmuted. Okay, great. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Concordia University's fourth space. Thank you for joining us for today's event, One Love Literary, a podcast conversation whole, uh, hosted by Olga Sigankova with her very special guest, Kevin Pask. And to help situate you, we are streaming to YouTube live from Forest Space, and we are located on unceded Indigenous lands in Chijage, Montreal. And here at Forest Space, we work with our university committee, uh, community to mobilize knowledge by co-creating daily activities to examine research questions and projects that are in development here across the university. We're running this event as a live stream meeting, so we welcome your comments and questions with a raised hand or via the chat if you're joining by Zoom afterwards. And for those of you in the space, if you'd like to participate, just let us know, raise your hand and we'll be sure to get a microphone to you. And with that, it is now my pleasure to hand it over to Olga. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and welcome to One Love Literary, a series of conversations about literature, sorry, uh, where we talk about things most forbidden, our literary loves and hates. My name is Olga. Um, I'm a PhD student in literature, and today I am very excited to welcome Dr. Karen Pask, a literary scholar and professor in the English department at Concordia, who has also been, full disclosure, my thesis supervisor. And um, his research centers on Shakespeare and Renaissance literature, but also includes fairy and folk tales, song lyrics, and Texas cultural history. Dr. Pask is the author of The Emergence of the English Author and The Fairy Way of Writing, Shakespeare to Tolkien, and is now working on his next project, Pastorals of Reading in the Age of Criticism, which we are also going to discuss today. Thank you so much for agreeing to participate in the podcast. Um, all right, so let's start. Um, yeah. Great. So these conversations are um, as much about the experience of being a literary scholar as about literary scholarship itself. So I'm going to start with some personal journey questions. Um, um, so why did you decide to go to college and study literature in the first place? What was the impetus? Well, going to college was sort of a, a, a no brainer at that time, since people just sort of went to college if you had any kind of you, you were doing it all well in high school. So that wasn't going to college seemed to be sort of something I never even really thought there was an alternative exactly. So um, but why study, not law? Or, why not law? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's what I guess that's what my my parents thought at the time, because I remember that um, I remember when I was about 13 or so, my mother sort of saying, Oh, you would be a really good international lawyer. I don't know what she, I don't, I'm not even quite sure what she had in mind as what international law might actually mean. Yes. Um, but there was a thought like that, let's say. But um, my family, fortunately for me, really, really wasn't very heavy handed about insisting that I do one thing or the other ultimately. And there was a sort of a benign neglect, let's say, to use a phrase that cropped up in, in political terms and other very different terms, a kind of benign neglect about what I was doing with my life. Um, so it sort of allowed me to kind of easily follow some direction that made sense to me at the time. Did um, you have any apprehensions? Were you thinking, oh, what am I going to do with this, with the literature degree later on? Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, I certainly had apprehensions about it, but in some ways I also didn't, what I might be doing when I was 30, sort of when I was 21 or 22 or 23 seemed like a long time in the future. And I didn't necessarily take full charge of what it might mean to, to do this over the longer haul. But, um, but even when I started, it was already a profession, you know, literary studies and literary scholarship was a profession that wasn't exactly booming with job opportunities. The whole glut of jobs that happened in the 60s through the early 70s in North America had already expired. And you could read stories about, you know, PhDs driving car taxi cabs and, you know, that sort of thing. That was, you know, already quite common. Mm -hmm. um, but I was just, I, I just, 
didn't pay attention very no. closely. Um, so, yeah. So you chose it because you were really good at it or because it was something you really wanted to do? I, I think I was good. I think I was pretty good at it. I think that, um, I think that in some ways I thought like I want, I really, I knew I really wanted to be a kind of an intellectual. That was my real desire. Mm -hmm. And literary studies was turned out to be the, the kind of the conduit toward that for me, I think simply because I happened to intersect with university life right around a moment when literary studies was really, uh, super interesting oh, i see so there was a, like a lot of this sort of movement towards structuralism and post-structuralism you know various kinds of literary theory was very literary theory seemed very much to be a, a super exciting thing to be involved with at that particular juncture so that was i think that was part of that i mean i certainly was, was a reader and a literary reader um but i'm i'm not sure that I would have necessarily chosen literary studies necessarily only for that reason, but it was mm -hmm. partly because I kind of came in contact with a certain, a, a kind of a hypercharged sense of fruition of literary studies, let's say, literary theory. I see. Um, and what was your reading background before you started studying literature in college versus, you know, how it changed later on? Um, yeah, I think I, I I think that I was a fairly um, typical boy reader of that time of the '60s because I remember one of the books that I was a I I read repeatedly was called Strange but True Football Stories. Um, so. Uh, <laughs> You know, and you, I would just sort of get that out. And there were, these were true stories about crazy things that happened at football games, you know, like whatever. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, I would get that out and like just go back and go through these great comic, tragic comic events and sports history. I read sports biographies. Um, I read fa fantasy literature, children's literature. I think, it, I think that what sort of, I think that a, a certain kind of change happened in that regard, when I was about 13, and I remember deciding that I, I, I needed to read more seriously. Mm -hmm. And that I, I remember going to my school library and checking out a copy of uh, Dickens' David Copperfield. <laughs> okay. And, um, and I read Dickens a lot for several years. And Dickens was a real kind of but I was reading, I read Dickens and loved Dickens, but I was also, I also sort of turned to Dickens because I had in my mind that this was kind of classic literature and I should be reading it. So I think that at, in early adolescence, I did sort of develop some, some idea that, and that was probably part of the road towards literary scholarship is that I, I really should be reading classic literature. And Dickens was synonymous with yeah, serious. Yeah, Dickens meant classic literature to me. And it was it was a good, in some ways, a great introduction to reading some of that material because I remember reading David Copperfield, which literary scholars now I don't think have much time for because it's so sentimental. It's also very... It's huge. It's so sentimental. Safe. But, you know, that novel ends with David saying, you know, about his beloved who's a, you know, uh, whose name I forget. It's just, I, and never did I see the shadow of an, another passing of her. That mm -hmm. is to say, they became a union. And I just remember just like, oh, <laughs> I was like weepy for days after that. Aww. And that's, you know, and, and that's kind of a powerful experience. It's one of the experiences about love, I guess one of our, our topic here, yes. loving literature is the moments when you're reading when the the experiences the characters the experiences you're reading about seem kind of much more real to you than your your actual lived experiences for some period of time so there would be periods of time when i was an adolescent when what i was reading as literature or fiction it didn't need to be necessarily literature 
would just feel like kind of overwhelm emotionally overwhelming enough that it overwhelmed it went over the banks of the, the, the place between fiction and reality that is to say my reality became sort of less than my my experience of fiction mm -hmm. so I think that's a I think that's a very um, kind of primary experience for a lot of people who who become readers is that that experience of the power of the fictional experience uh, as greater than their sort of their momentary reality at that point Mm -hmm. It's interesting to talk about whether or not that has a place in literary scholarship, you know, which is, I think, what we're going to talk about today, a little, you know. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So do you feel, though, that your tastes changed after you received a formal education in literature? I mean, of course they changed. You stopped reading children's books and you know, probably that, but in wow. any more, in any deeper sense, did you, did, did you feel that, oh, now that I know all these things, I can never go back to reading Dickens the way I read him before or something like that? Yeah, I mean, I feel uh, there, there's always a bit of that. I mean, Dickens, I, you know, I don't, I haven't read David Copperfield again since mm -hmm. I read it at 13 or thereabouts. And, you know, I would probably find it probably too sentimental now. Uh, well, although maybe not. Um, yes, there are things you, I mean, one of the things I, I think I find in my, you know, in my older age is that you do, but you do kind of come back to things that you loved. Um, and that's a, that's a pleasure too, the things that you loved much earlier, you can allow yourself to re-experience that kind of love one more time. With mm -hmm. in terms in 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 terms of literary fiction, for sure, I think. Um, I mean, I loved *Wind in the Willows* when I was a very when I was very young, and I think that in some ways, you know, we're gonna we're talking about pastoral. *Wind in the Willows* is child's pastoral mm -hmm. um, in some ways, and I'm always ready to come back and re re enjoy that pleasure. Mm -hmm. But there are other things, of course, that you don't you know maybe you don't you never really quite come back to i was thinking over the weekend i was reading about historical fiction um a recent book by uh the, uh, the kind of marxist um theorist perry anderson and he wrote and he mentions james michener's historical fictions and i was a huge reader of michener which are monster books they're like 1500 pages and that's unlike Dickens or unlike The Wind in the Willows. I'm not sure I can, I'm not sure I'm ever going to go back to those. Uh, although I have no, I, you know, I have no regrets about having been a reader of that kind of massive, you know, kind of historical fiction. Well, some books are only good for one reading. It's just the way they are, I guess. Yeah. 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 Um, and right. So you have chosen to talk about uh, Roland Barthes and his essay, The Pleasure of the Text. Um, does that reflect on your reading practices? Do you separate reading for pleasure from reading for work, for example? I, I do. I believe that I do to some extent. Um, there are certainly works that I read that don't seem to, that seem, they, they don't, I, I don't find a place for them necessarily in these criticism or scholarship that I do. Um, and maybe that's part of the pleasure there. Um, and there are equally works that I read for that I that I read, let's say for work, but I wouldn't necessarily pick them up outside of my relationship mm -hmm. to work. Like Spencer, I teach Spencer all the time. But it but to say, when I say that I want to back up and say that that doesn't mean that there is that there's no pleasure in the things that you read for work like i really i've come to really love spencer too yes. but this but i i would also say that it would it's hard to imagine the moment at which i'm just going to pick up spencer totally outside of any context of thinking about it, it's so immersed in my thinking about the, 
the, the critic criticism and scholarship and the Renaissance and all of those things that it's hard for me to imagine the moment at which I would just sort of pick it up and kind of leaf through the pages and just sort of experience it in that in that pleasurable form, let's say. Um, but it, but that's a that's that's still a pleasure. It's so a pleasure different that I take. kinds of pleasure. Different kinds of pleasure, which is Bart. That's part of Bart's point as yes. well, which is the very yeah. different and part of what I really uh, appreciate about what Bart is doing is that that um, that kind of allowance uh, that he has for all of the, sh the the different shapes of reading and reading pleasure. Yeah, for me, I guess reading for pleasure means that I read something that's outside of the assigned school readings. It doesn't necessarily mean that the register is very different, but just it's something that's just mine and mm -hmm. does not belong to the school curriculum. And that just gives me a sense of freedom, you know, from all the syllabi and all the things that I have to do. But it's not necessarily um, more pleasurable per se. It's just something that's just mine. Do you have that something like that? Yeah, although it's a funny thing because I think that one of the things I've tended to do in my more recent work has been to try to reincorporate the things that I might have once thought of as just entirely outside of my critical work and bring them back into the scholarship and the criticism. Um, so, you know, I, I, in my book on Shakespeare and fantasy and Tolkien, mm -hmm. I, I included a chapter on Tolkien, which is, for me, was including a kind of critical work on something that really had previously felt to me like something that had no relationship mm -hmm. to any anything I was doing in my in my scholarly work or critical work. So you try to integrate those. I'm open to personal I'm, to work and yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm 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 interested in that. Mm -hmm. I'm interested in in that and I'm interested in the varieties of pleasures that reading produces some of which are can be completely personal completely outside of the scholarly the school the academic context um, but maybe don't always have to be mm -hmm. since i think one of the things that literary studies tends to do is it has a tendency to um uh, to focus on the literary works that we believe to be important mm -hmm. for one reason or another. Yeah. Whereas in some ways, literary studies as a, as a discipline should be attentive to the full range is the full range of literary reading. Basically, yeah. that shouldn't there's nothing there's nothing within the domain of reading that should be foreign to us as critics and scholars. But we do take very seriously in our profession that that designation of critic, that is to say, you know, making judgments. And if you ask me to make a judgment between like, you know, James Joyce and Stephen King, I'll say, well, you know, Joyce is the greater writer. And, and so therefore, I might say, Joyce is therefore the writer that I need to teach. Hmm. Um, and I think also, a lot of people do that. There are also uh, levels of prestige and amounts of prestige associated with various literatures and various genres and various authors. Oh, absolutely. And that comes into the critic's own prestige. If you're looking at Joyce, your status is going to be probably higher in the field than if you're working with Stephen King, let's say. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt that that's, um, that, that certainly plays a role in these decisions. But also just that there's, I would say as well, there's just a kind of there's a place for you. There's the whole world of people who work on Joyce, right? So you can go to the conference. Oh yes, right? awesome. you, know, yes. you can you can contribute to the journal. Um, you know, people who are doing Keith Stephen King studies are, you know, they're more they're a little bit more sort of out there in the wilderness in, in terms in, in terms of literary scholarly literary criticism. Yes. Um, so I felt that when I wrote about Tolkien, which sort of feels like. <laughs> 
oh, you're really joining the, you know, this kind of very, you know, marginalized world of people who are obsessed by Tolkien. Mm -hmm. um, so I felt like it was kind of uh, a, a challenge to incorporate that into, let's say, works that the other works that I might be addressing that might be considered more kind of high, serious, canonical pieces of English literature. Interesting. People who work on Tolkien unite. <laughs> All right. Um, so, again, coming back to the Bart's essay, um, its title, I feel, is aimed as a provocation, you know, the pleasure of, of the text. Mm -hmm. um, he's mixing two things that seemingly do not belong together. Theory, because he uses the word text, um, and pleasure, as sensuous, emotional, you know, state. Why do you think this essay, when it came out, made, it did make a fuss, right? It was a, it was a big thing. I think. I think it made a splash. Yes. I was, um, I wasn't quite around then. I mean, it's interesting for me because I, um, I was looking into the history of the text. It was published, first published in French in 1973, published, translated into English in 1975. I was around 14 or thereabouts at that point, and I looked at, I spent time in bookstore looking at things. I probably encountered the name Bart right around that time. Um, it seemed, he seemed like someone who was very serious uh, and was associated with something that was called structuralism that sounded yeah. very serious to me and, you know, very intimidating. And he was being promoted by Susan Sontag during that period. So that was, Susan Sontag was a critic, an American critic, um, who was associated with very serious issues. So I thought that was, and I had read a little bit of Susan Sontag and she was sort of promoting Roland Barthes. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was a very, someone who was probably very important and very serious. Um, but at that particular juncture was still sort of quite beyond, I think, my own ability to read or to read with any kind of insight what he was mm -hmm. trying to do it was, of course, it's immersed, he's immersed in the French canon, yeah. which was largely foreign to me at, mm -hmm. at that point. Um, but yeah, the role between, you're, you're, you're going back to your question, though, the relationship between pleasure and literary theory. Yes. I mean, there's in some ways, it's strange that there might be considered this sort of gap between pleasure and literary theory, since for, you know, um, uh, for hundreds, virtually thousands of years, the whole idea of literature had been associated, you know, with the idea of, of pleasing, you know, the Horatian, you know, to, you know, to, 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 to please or and instruct. Yes. Um, is what literature was sort of understood to do. Um, so the idea that pleasure might be understood in some ways as distinct from literature is, feels relatively new. But yeah, it does Bart was... New. Yeah, but at that point, wasn't it very much the adopted stance that literature is very intellectual, it's completely apart from pleasure, it's all about the high canon and um yeah i mean although again the high canon can be very pleasurable um right so i mean i'm dickens let's say being my example i was kind of running with there um but yeah there is a kind of a sense that pleasure mere pleasure was um was a kind of ignoble aspiration of literature that that all it could you know that pleasing readers was a uh, 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 just a kind of a secondary or even risible mm -hmm. aspect of what literature could do that that there needed to be a kind of a more uh let's say sublime uh um, you know uh aspiration on the part of literature and on the part of uh, critics and scholars who, who write about literature. So I think that, yes, something of that was in place by the time Bart is writing 
but he's in there why by using a term like the text instead of well reading liter- or, yeah. reading yeah the the pleasure of reading uh the text was of course signaling something more in tune with the kind of structuralist pr- approach with which art had been previously associated so one of the things that's very interesting about that moment is first of all you know 1973 when it's published in france you're just after the kind of you're five years or so after the kind of the upheavals of the may 68 you know kind of parisian rebellion yes. uh that was still very much um it's only five years old at that point still very much in the air in terms of french intellectual life um and bart is um in some ways kind of responding to that to some extent Mm. responding against that against the certain kind of highly developed intellectual systems that all you know need to serve you know some kind of revolutionary project or something along those lines um and also in some ways responding to himself since the the previous book that i know about is Mm sz which is this you know, very kind of arch structuralist, you know, account of a single short story by Balzac uh, that is doing the kind of uh, hyper, let's say, uh, uh, developed close reading, uh, breaking it down into a variety of kind of structuralist um, uh, uh, categories of analysis that Bart does in that book of criticism so he moves from this very structuralist text like sz only Mm -hmm. two years previously to the pleasure of the text which is suddenly very unstructured very very aphoristic so he's sort of writing some now he's sort of so he's sort of suddenly moving into this kind of uh you know very kind of in some ways kind of classically french uh aphoristic style let's say so he's more in line with la rochefoucauld or someone like that than he is with like you know levi strauss or someone like that who would have defined structuralism at that point Mm -hmm. so yes he he uses he uses a term the text which places it very much in line with a kind of you know literary theory at that moment Mm -hmm. but what he does with that is quite strange and interesting So before we go into the distinctions that he makes, I'm interested in your opinion on the large claim that he makes about the pleasure of the text and that he compares um, he compares the reading process and the writing process to basically sex and sexual activity. Okay, with the jouissance or the bliss. Yes, like he, he claims that the text uh desires the reader and so on so he makes these very clear parallels and i'm wondering uh when i was reading this text i i read this part where he says the text desires the reader and i felt i feel that this text really (laughs) desires itself much more (laughs) than it desires me (laughs) as a reader but well there um, is there's a funny kind of autoeroticism of art i think that's that's interesting (laughs) (laughs) yeah so what do you what do you think about that do you do you uh ascribe to that claim do you feel there is any parallel or do you feel the pleasure of reading is in any way similar to a real sensual pleasure? Because it seems to me that it's very much, you know, in your like head space rather than yeah. body space. But yeah, I don't. I I would have to say that I don't. I don't subscribe to that myself. I don't experience. I don't experience experience the the pleasure of reading as an as an erotic pleasure. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that I, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by Barth's articulation of that. I don't, but I have to say it doesn't resonate for me personally. Um, I think that, what, what can you say? It's, it's the, you know, the 20th century is the century of Freud. And so, you know, so from Freud through Lacan, through Lacan's concept of jouissance as this kind of experience beyond, it's kind of this kind of excess pleasure beyond, even beyond uh, 
the sexual itself mm -hmm. uh, beyond the, you know, beyond the kind of the order of language itself from Lacan that I guess, I mean, again, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not a Lacanian by any stretch of the imagination, but this must have been something, again, part of that sort of stru French structuralist matrix that mm -hmm. is informing Barthes at that point, um, and that takes him down that road. So, but, but it is very true that bliss, jouissance, is what takes, tends to, he tends to associate that with the higher, uh, kind of a higher literary mode. So it's the, it's the class, it's the great text in some ways. Yeah. He's not using the word great, I mean, which is nice because no, he's yes. not, but he is, but he, what he wants to describe is something that let's say he's going to associate with, um, you know, with, with, with Proust, uh, uh, with, with modernist French modernist like Proust, with Flaubert in the background, you know these these writers who sort of he seems to associate with this uh, you know this kind of stronger experience. Pleasure is uh, is, is 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 not it's not really sexualized, is it? Mm -hmm. It's the kind of a less intense experience for Bach. Interesting, but he does make this very clear distinction at the beginning between pleasure and bliss i think in in the in the original plaisir and yeah. jouissance and he does associate pleasure with a more basic i think experience direct That's experience of something very interesting or exciting in 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 the book that you're reading and bliss was something that breaks and uh interferes and uh, interrupts and uh, something more transgressive, I That's guess. Right, yeah. But then, as the text continues, those boundaries seem to collapse, and he seems to get confused That's uh, right. where, That's right. where That's pleasure right. is and where bliss, and it's all getting into this one big category of undefined. There's this real conceptual problem that it's like the the, the whole book is about pleasure, but then immediately when he gets so he immediately gets into a need to kind of uh create two categories one bliss one pleasure so there's the larger category of pleasure and then there's the subcategories one of one of one of the subcategories being pleasure again so you see the problem already if it's yes. all a form of pleasure but then at, a, at another level there's an opposition opposition between bliss and pleasure it lends itself to every form of confusion and yes. misunderstanding and so forth. I mean, I'm, I, I completely understand that, that experience of reading it because I have that experience as well. But I, I find that there's a kind of, um, I think that what really appeals to me about it is the kind of um, Bart's, he's not, pursuing this in any kind of absolute sense. He's not really forcing you to kind of uh, accept his category of bliss and his category of pleasure. He's letting them run into each other to some extent. Mm -hmm. um, and you don't really have to accept all of his terms in order to accept some of them, I find. Um, and But I guess what I would say is that um, he does participate in something that is very characteristic of the 20th century, which is to sort of say that in terms in cultural things in literary things, that which is merely pleasurable is somewhat less valuable. Mm -hmm. He so he wants to create that kind of additional category of bliss, which or jouissance. So that's transgressive. That takes you outside of what is sort of let's say the pleasures of the bourgeoisie. Yes, pleasures of mass culture. They're not real pleasures, um, and I think there's a tendency in twentieth in twentieth century culture, in our culture as well, twenty first century, to allow that d distinction yes uh, but it is interesting that he doesn't negate those pleasures either he incorporates all of them into this big category yeah absolutely 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 yeah. so he tends to i think there's a tendency to 
I mean, I think the the openness of Bart is the sort of sense that they're all pleasures, and he's open to all of them, um, and he experiences all of them himself because he sort of says, "Here I am." When you're reading Jules Verne, you know you're not reading him. It's a page turner. He says, "You know, you move quickly, yes. and if you move slow down, it falls apart as a text, as a reading experience." But if you're reading, you know. Stendhal or Proust or Flaubert, you know, if you try to read them too fast, you have the, that's when, that's when those texts fall apart. Yes. So they require their different, the temporalities even of those pleasures mm -hmm. are, are quite different. But what I like about it is he's still quite open to the pleasures that he's going to associate with a very popular children's writer like Jules Verne. Yes. And I think he says about Proust that Every time you read Proust, you encounter something that you slept through the last <laughs> time you read Proust. <laughs> so it's a new pleasure every time. Yeah. Yeah. And he's, you know, he, he understands himself to be, you know, in some ways, first and foremost, a reader of Proust, but it's that, it's that kind of reading that he's engaged in. He's not a scholar of Proust. He says this right up front, but he's, he, Proust is the thing, the writer he keeps coming back to and the writer that in some ways shapes his experience of, of writing, of reading, excuse yeah. me. Yeah. Um, so I was very intrigued by this um, quote in Bart, and he says, it is not the violence which affects pleasure, um, nor is it a destruction which interests it, what pleasure wants is the sight of a loss, the seam, the cut, the deflation, the dissolve, which seizes the subject in the midst of bliss. What do you think is the sight of a loss in relation to reading? I think that, <clears throat> I think that Bart is coming to, I think that what he's trying to theorize there, what he's trying to write about is that sense that that sense of bliss that we've already been discussing, or jouissance as that which is in some ways beyond mm -hmm. the breaking of some ordinary relationship to mm -hmm. writing. The difficulty, for example, the rupture or the break or the seam can simply be writing that you experience as difficult as doesn't exp it doesn't explain itself to you yeah. it it holds itself back from you yeah um that is the kind of writing with which bart is kind of associating this idea of the, the, the blissful mm -hmm. text let's say the text which produces that and, and in, in this in this respect he's this is very i would say Kind of characteristically modernist sense of literary pleasure not as the pleasure that comes and um cuddles up with you yeah it's the pleasure that is fearsome standoffish resisting your approach mm -hmm. um in, in some ways the way that we tend to we tend to think of modernist difficult literary text mm -hmm. um so in, that goes back to something I guess I was saying earlier, the way in which Bart is sort of associating um, uh, the pleasure of jouissance with a particular kind of literary modernism, which is oppositional, adversarial with relationship to the larger culture, um, which is transgressive in the positioning of the writer uh, for, you know, nowadays we, so, you know, we, we have, a, we tend to associate that with a kind of, let's say a kind of, you know, a kind of a sexual, mm -hmm. uh, sexual identity as transgressive, for mm -hmm. example. Um, that's, a, that's a little bit different than what Barth has in mind with his eroticism of the text, but it's not entirely unrelated. I see. You know, we don't, you know, we, we, we tend to want literary texts which are expressing a kind of transgressive desire. We, that's, that feels to us like, like the right stuff, let's mm -hmm. say. We don't want texts which just sort of bring us back to, you know, 
boy meets girl, let's say, yeah. Um, yeah. which tends to feel like, oh, that's, that's kind of, that's a very kind of ordinary pleasure. Yes. Um, what, what Lionel Trilling in his essay on, on pleasure calls, he's citing another critic who says, who, who, who's writing about what that critic calls specious pleasures. That is to say, the pleasures of, that are commoditized mm -hmm. in our culture, the pleasures that are too easy, the pleasures that seem like pleasures, but we can't really, we can't ultimately accept them as pleasures because mm -hmm. we are ourselves kind of cultural, you know, culture critics. Yeah. So we hold ourselves back from that kind of pleasure. Yes, it's interesting that he says a sight of a loss and sometimes that's, um, that kind of reading can be, can entice a very serious sense of loss, right? A sense of loss of your identity or mm -hmm. a sense of loss of the ground where on which you're standing. It can be, it's interesting that he says it's a pleasure. And I, I think it's, you know, I can agree with that, but it mm -hmm. takes it takes some experience and it takes some emotional maturity to experience that as pleasure, I guess. Yeah. That absolutely. loss that you encounter in, in that kind of reading, in the difficult reading. Okay, so uh, your book project is um, titled The Pastorals of Reading. And could you explain a little bit what you mean by that? And how is it connected to Bart's, Bart's ideas and Bart's essay? Well, the, the, uh, the book, I, I'm using the idea of the, the, an old idea of, of pastoral um, as a kind of a genre and it goes back to my, you know, my kind of period of specialization, which is the Renaissance, when mm -hmm. pastorals are, you know, they're very, they become a very important part of the, the literary landscape. And they're very much texts that are about uh, experiencing pleasure and experiencing a certain kind of pleasure, which is the pleasure of taking yourself. And this is often pastorals um, in the Renaissance are about taking effectively aristocrats going to the countryside in disguise as shepherds and shepherdesses and experiencing and it's in it's in the, and it is very in fact quite eroticized it's very mm -hmm. much about going out taking yourself outside of the courtly world highly regulated regimented experience of court the court the the aristocratic and regal courts of the renaissance and going out into this place where you can let us say let it all hang out mm -hmm. um, and that's what's being associated with shepherds and shepherdesses which is a certain kind of erotic freedom mm -hmm. um, so i'm kind of following the very great english critic william empson who kind of updated the idea of pastoral to include a whole bunch of different kinds of literary experience that weren't necessarily the old the old school version of shepherds and shepherdesses i'm kind of following that model in effect to sort of talk about very sophisticated readers and what i'm really thinking about is mainly kind of uh readers that we associate with the kind of the foundation of critics of academic literary criticism in the early 20th century mm -hmm. and their on the one hand their their high commitment to uh to the kind of classics of literature and on the other hand some of the instances where readers and critics celebrate this kind of a kind of reading experience which connects them much more to ordinary readers mm -hmm. uh, to lowbrow readers to forms of reading which don't actually belong to the kind of uh, celebra <laughs> celebration or elaboration of a kind of a great uh, canonical literary tradition. Mm -hmm. So you state that at a certain point, the readership got divided into common and professional readers. Um, could you talk a little bit about that? Um, do common readers need to aspire to become more professional? Uh, no, no. Okay. The, the, the second to answer the second part first. No, no, I don't think common <laughs> readers should. I don't think that that's the goal here okay. um, that uh, common readers um, don't need. I mean, sometimes common readers go to university and take 
you know, literature classes, English literature, or variety, any other literatures, and they learn some things about professional reading. But that doesn't mean that they need to all become professional readers uh, or uncommon readers. So it's or better. It's better to be a professional reader than a common reader. Well, I guess not. Uh, no, no, it's 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 only better if that's what you really want to do with your life. Yeah. You know, you want to spend that you want to kind of devote yourself to to that kind of elaboration of your reading process mm -hmm. to make the reading and make the results of that reading as you know, to, to kind of give them that elaboration to produce that kind of hopefully value to them or that ability to to convey the value of the reading to other scholars and critics and so forth. But that isn't really the desire of, that, sh that shouldn't be what every common reader needs to do. Mm -hmm. I, I think that the division between uh, kind of professional readers or, uh, and, and a, a more common readers comes, the, the real moment for that comes in the late 19th century when across Europe, North America, you begin to get kind of the, the strongest movements towards universal literacy. So suddenly you have like mass readers, mm -hmm. ma a kind of a mass readership. And one of the things you can see in the late 19th century and the early 20th century is the really strong uh, reaction of the kind of elite bourgeois aristocratic um, uh, cultural groups in country after country are responding to this idea of a universal education. Mm -hmm. Everyone can, you know, and if, even then, of course, not everyone read, but there is at least becomes the kind of uh, universal asp aspiration of universal literacy. Mm -hmm. But when everyone can read, or when you can assume that everyone is, uh, to some extent or another, has learned how to read or is learning how to read, then reading is no longer this kind of great reading itself, being able to kind of take a text and read it is no longer this kind of great, uh, you know, achievement that marks you off from others. Earlier cultures to be able to read is already uh, a kind of a marker of distinction. So one of the things I guess I'm kind of arguing in this book, as I as I see it anyway, is that a secondary process kind of steps in where there needs to be kind of a, a much greater distinction between higher forms of reading, critical reading, and ordinary reading. And it's part of a, dis a distinction which uh, the, the development of a, a, a professional class of readers the, the, in, an ac in a literary academic context needs to distinguish itself from ordinary readers, partly by developing these, uh, these highly elaborated forms of reading, which we would call, which we now call literary criticism, mm -hmm. um, and which didn't really exist before the early 20th century. If you go back to literary criticism before the 20th century, it's written in the, it's written for ordinary readers, it's very often being written in journals and magazines that ordinary readers that, you know, a wide range of readers have access to, but it's the specialized skills of academic literary criticism are developing only really in the 20th century and partly in relationship to the new kind of universal sense of li <coughs> literacy. So we, we make ourselves, let us say we literary academics make ourselves necessary, at least in our own minds, mm -hmm. we make ourselves necessary to society through our through our highly elaborated scientific or at least claim to be you know claims to scientific um, forms of literary criticism which is one of the things that structuralism Bart's own structuralism was doing was claiming a certain kind of uh, scientific mantle for itself uh, as a form of as a form of reading that was considered highly uh, highly difficult form of reading highly abstruse not something that ordinary readers could have access to but you're saying that that's a fairly recent invention yes about 100 years 
yeah. roughly, I would say about a hundred years old. Mm -hmm. We're now, we, you know, the nowadays, I think the tendency is to say that, that acad uh, uh, academic literary criticism, as opposed to certain kinds of literary study that might have existed before that, which would be mainly philology, mm -hmm. uh, study of languages, uh, or, or uh, biblical textual studies, for example. All of those things were sort of much more dominant in the 19th century, but the study of modern vernacular languages and their literatures um, and is, is something that is really kind of mainly belongs to the early 20th century, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, so you talk uh, in your research, you talk about social forms, right? What mm -hmm. are social forms? Um, I'm, I'm using it pretty loosely, that is to say, forms of, forms of, I, I use the, I use the term, the phrase social forms instead of literature, because some of them are kind of outside of the, the written text, let's say. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm interested in forms that, a kind that are not dominated by a single writer, single author, mm -hmm. but are have are kind of let's say loosely constructed by uh, various kinds of coteries of, of of performers, writers, readers, even the fairy tale, for example, or mm -hmm. folk tale. Uh, one example of a kind of uh, social form which has no no clearly defined author. It's not a single production of a single individual, but a kind of, let's say, a kind of uh, historical production of a community, or even moving between communities, because, because of course, fairy, t fairy tales, folk tales are, you know, they're quite mobile. They move from group to group, from language to language, and they take different forms, but I would call them uh, social forms, instead mm -hmm. of being sort of dominated by a uh, the, the the thing that we that we tend to study in academic literary discourse tends to be we tend to focus on the single author mm -hmm. um, uh, as the as our sort of model of our model of what literary production is. So I'm sort of just sort of playing around in that phrase with other forms of production that don't, aren't I, and then in some ways don't seem quite literary to me because literary already to me implies uh, the written word, that which privileges the written, which privileges uh, the identification of, of a single writer. Um, so social forms are old songs, so old folk, folk songs, tales, those sorts of, mm -hmm. those sorts of productions. And do you ascribe um, those leisure bliss binaries to social forms, let's say, versus literature, author, authored, single author literature? Are those lines somehow, do they correlate with those forms in any way? Um, well, I certainly wouldn't I would never want to say that um, that there's any unpleasure that 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 I ascribe a certain unpleasure to this the the literary text I like I really I'm very involved in literary texts written by single single authors but there is something to me very uh, I I like the I like the pastoral experience let's say of the forms of tale and song and lyric that come out of experiences that are not high literary. So there's that kind, there's the, the social form, that phrase social form is partly a kind of identification of what is for me a certain kind of pleasure. And I think, I think for other mm -hmm. readers as well, and it's, and it's not unsophisticated. This is often very sophisticated readers who are very interested in other kinds of voices, let's yes. say, um, that are not coming out of the, the very kind of, you know, kind of high canonical um, experience of literature. And so I would say, yes, if, if you're saying, it, it was your question that bliss or pleasure? 
is something that I associate with special yeah. forms, right? Yes, I would say that is not bliss, <laughs> which is a term that leads feels sort of. Um, I'm not sure how to use bliss for myself. Yeah. Um, but certainly, for me, a kind of a kind of pleasure, mm -hmm. um, a kind of pleasure of that which often inserts itself ultimately into literature and refreshes literature um, from different places, right? So the way in which, for example, you know, the folk, the old folk ballads, folk, both folk ballads and even, you know, kind of the more commercialized ballads that circulated in England come into romantic poetry mm -hmm. with Wordsworth and, Co and Coleridge, for example. That's a that's a kind of a pastoral moment where high pr <laughs> producers of high literary texts are kind of looking at low forms and in some form or another incorporating them. Yes. Does it break down the idea of pleasure versus bliss in a sense? Because pleasure becomes the part of this higher um, register trans more transgressive perhaps more right literature. it can feel transgressive at the moment the the and maybe that is it's hard for it's it's you know because now wordsworth and coleridge are now so much a part of the literary curriculum it's hard to it's hard to recapture if that was if that felt transgressive or bliss like to yes, to, to 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 readers at the moment um i tend to doubt it um but yeah you think it it was not i think it was not okay i think it was new and maybe the new the novelty approached what bart is describing as a kind of uh tra as a as a transgression mm -hmm. Um, and therefore, in, by his account, a kind of verging on blissful. Um, a lot of things that we that we experience as sort of the standard part, uh, you know, so, sort of standards of our literary reading and our literary experience were, at one point or another, they were they had their own kind of transgressive elements. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, right. So we're kind of running out of time and I'll ask um, one more question then we'll take a question from the audience <laughs> <laughs> right so let's talk a little bit about waste because that was the that was the title of our conversation today and what is this concept of waste in relation to literature and reading and is it related to pleasure um because yes. you write about waste right uh -huh. yes i do write about waste i'm very i'm i'm interested in shakespearean waste and renaissance waste and in contemporary waste as well um so yes it's and for me it's a it's a question of pleasure because one of the things that's really has intrigued me for years about there are certain moments in shakespeare where waste and in particular the wasting of time becomes a very positive experience. Mm -hmm. And I would say in a kind of pastoral context, where you go into the countryside, you dress as a shepherd, and you waste your time. And that is used not as a as a pejorative, but as a kind of positive experience of spending time in this carefree fashion. So just to you know, one example in in a play that I love very much, speaking of pleasures is Shakespeare's As You Like It, where when Celia and Rosalind, and of course, they're, they're very aristocratic, you know, these are, you know, these are royal, you know, these are members of the royal families. Um, uh, when Celia and Rosalind arrive in the forest of Arden, Celia says, I like this place and could willingly waste my time in it. And what she means is, uh, of course, wasting time in some ways not unlike our own sense of wasting time but she means partly she means that obviously she has a sort of sense of a positive experience it is to spend your time freely 
to be careless, to be in some ways, to have a certain kind of aristocratic sense that the aristocratic positive associated with wasting is expenditure. Aristocrats spend. Oh, I see. Yeah. They so spend it's like freely. luxury, basically. Yeah. It's like luxury. It's like luxury. And it was, re in some ways, it was the one of the required virtues of, 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 a, of a Renaissance aristocracy, of a Renaissance aristocrat, was to spend freely. Mm -hmm. Just as you hand, just as you spend freely on your, your followers, uh, your servants, you give freely. That was like the virtue of the aristocrat in the period. And you do the same thing with your own time. You, 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 don't, you don't turn it to productive uses. That's something that happens later in, in a famous essay by E.P. Thompson, which is work discipline. And the, you know, his, his famous essay on time and work discipline is basically saying that the modern understanding of time as needing to be productive is a product of effectively, he says, you know, sort of 18th century kind of English capitalist practices. Mm -hmm. But an, a, a Renaissance aristocrat has not fallen into that world. Um, when Portia speaks of her husband Bassanio in The Merchant of Venice, she talks about uh, his, her affection for his friends because she says, men who do converse, and here she's talking about the, his, her husband and his male friend world, friends who do converse and waste the time together, she says, have these, these characteristics in common, which means that um, the fact that I love Bassanio means I must also have tremendous affection for his, all of his friends, including Antonio, the one mm -hmm. who's in grave danger at that point. And again, it's that sort of sense of spending time, wasting time as a positive. So, in some ways, I'm uh, I'm interested in waste. And that's very. It's a, in Shakespeare. It's a very aristocratic context. Mm -hmm. um, I guess what I would like to say is, uh, in terms of our own reading practices in the 21st century, what kind of waste can we, you know, kind of reappropriate for ourselves yes. without necessarily falling into s simply simply trying to kind of reduplicate the. Uh, you know, the kind of uh, the world of the Renaissance aristocracy, which we don't need to do and we certainly don't want to do. Um, what can, how, how, can we, how can we waste the time together, as, as Portia says? Yes, I think it's, it's important in our uh, culture that is so obsessed with productivity and being productive and everything has to be uh, subjected to a certain productive goal. Yeah. I think the concept of reappropriating concept of waste as spending time in a way that is more of a luxury than a commodity, I think is, uh, is important. I think it's in interesting at least to look at in yeah. that way. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, and I'm, I think that in some ways, uh, even in the academy, we're still, maybe especially in the academy, we're still very driven by the sense of productivity mm -hmm. of our of our exercises, of our scholarship, of our criticism, of our studying, we have to sort of show the productive results. Yes. Um, and it drives, it, it, it drives the nature of modern society, and it drives the nature of modern intellectual society in ways that are, um, I think, not always beneficial to either society or to thinking. Agreed. <laughs> I agree. Okay, um, great. So we'll take a question if there is a question. Or there are some people in the Zoom. Well, I don't know if anyone on the Zoom is listening, or if anyone in the space has any questions. Um, you can you could raise your in the Zoom. You could raise your hand. Uh, are you welcome to just camera on and uh, ask your question? We'll hear you in the space. Uh, or you could put a question into the chat. Also, these are all options. We'll give you a minute there. Oh, we've got one question here in the space. I'll pass the mic to you. Thanks both for that um, very stimulating conversation. I um, was curious about something that you touched on earlier and maybe you can just elaborate. Um, you had brought up this idea, both of you, of um, returning to text. And Kevin, you were talking about like returning to text that you had enjoyed as a child and had maybe 
dismissed later in life. And Olga, you brought up this idea of that there are some texts that are worth rereading. And I'm curious if you could maybe both speak to, um, yeah, rereading as a concept, as a methodology that you employ as literary scholars. And if you see, um, you know, what if there's pleasure in rereading and what that particular pleasure might be. And also maybe if you can speak to like what the difference between rereading and um, reading for novelty might be. So there. Thank you so much. Rereading and reading and what you, so the question in some ways is asking about the, re, the experience of rereading and how you bring that back into certain scholarly activities. Is that, is that fair to, okay. Yeah. yeah. Or pleasure, yeah. Or pleasure, yeah. Because they're, I mean, of course, it can, it can certainly be both. Um, and I'm, uh, I think that it's always been intriguing to me when something that has that I've I've always been taken in my recent years, let's say, as I'm as I'm getting on in age, uh, that at moments when things that I had sort of put aside in my previous, you know, in my youth, in my more youthful years, uh, sort of as a you know as a kind of this should no longer characterize me. Because to associate myself with this is to demean myself as a kind of as a figure of you know I, sh I should be this kind of culturally admirable uh, person who likes the you know important things all the time um, that I've kind of given up so I I feel like I've allowed myself just to just to go back to anything and re-experience kinds of pleasures that I had, even at a very early age, I had kind of sort of separated myself from in order to inhabit the person the person and the personality that I thought befit me. So for example, just to get in the, in the world of popular culture, I'm really struck by how much I love Fleetwood Mac, given that when in the late 70s, when Fleetwood Mac was very popular, I was I was very much insisting that no, Fleetwood Mac had nothing to do with me. This, I'm like, I'm into all this really cool punk rock stuff <laughs> and I'm, that's who I am. So it's like partly kind of a, it's a process of self formation. You're kind of making those choices that make, you know, that kind of you're forming yourself. And then I say, well, like 10 years or so ago, I started realizing that you know, when a Fleetwood Mac song would come come on in some form or another, it was like, oh yeah, <laughs> I really like that. So uh, I'm not sure how to describe that in terms of my work exactly, except for the fact that I'm I'm much more comfortable in my later life with the weird range of things that I actually like, as opposed to the range of things that I probably and and they're not always opposed, but they're the things that I feel like. I should like as a as a kind of a cultural academic, you know, as an academic in the cultural world. And then there are things that then there are also some things that I probably shouldn't like as much, but I actually do like, and I no longer care too much whether whether that's the right likes or the wrong likes. I just sort of like them. Yeah, I, I'm not. I don't think that's entirely answering your question, but it is sort of okay. <laughs> I think that um, I, I, I can relate to that, but also I feel that my approach has been more, um, I have been less attempting to shape my identity by reading certain things rather than let the readings shape my identity, if you, if you see what I mean. And I guess rereading has been a large part of that because I love rereading and I always try to um, give it enough time to so I can forget the text a little bit. So then when I come back to it, I can re-experience the pleasure. Um, 
and for example, the book that I have been rereading lots of the lots of times is Jane Eyre. And uh, I, when I was growing up, my love for Jane Eyre was mocked by by my family a lot. <laughs> But they were like, oh, no, not again. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel like that was always, I had to assume that identity uh, of loving Jane Eyre, despite uh, the opinions of, of um, my environment. But the book has actually influenced and formed my identity to a very significant degree. And I feel that in that way, um, this pleasure and identity formation are so intertwined. And I feel that that's, that's, that holds for a lot of reading for me, is that it's a pleasure, but also it shapes you and forms you in, in so many ways that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, I guess we're going to wrap up. Thank you so much for doing this. Oh, it's a great pleasure. For, <laughs> for participating in this project. Thank you to all the listeners and the audience. And um, until next time, thank you so much. Woohoo! Thanks, Olga. Thank you, oh. Kevin. And thank you to everyone else uh, for coming into the Force Space today for this conversation. Everyone online and those of you here, thank you for your questions also. We'll be closing up the Zoom and the live stream now, but also just want to pass on a quick reminder that this conversation is already available on our YouTube channel if you'd like to revisit or share. But please come join us again at Force Space. Um, glad to have you. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon.